voiceover actor, uh, script adapter, and sometimes VO director. Some of my voice acting credits include, I'm totally not reading this, uh, Motochika in Sengoku Basra, he's a pirate. Agni in Black Butler, Germany in Hitalia, Grimmer in Monster, JP in Redline, Nekozawa in Oran, Sloth in Brotherhood, Lots in Fairy Tale, and Simon in Durarara, in addition to a bevy of other roles. Consult Wikipedia for more information. <laughs> right. Mr. Pegger Slides, once again, thank you for letting us do this interview. I know we interviewed you last year. I'm Ray from ERJProductions.com. I'm sure you met my buddy Lorenzo, who's yes. the co-owner. I just got a poker chip, live a poker <laughs> chip from him. Yes. Alright, uh, we're just wondering, uh, how are you enjoying Colorado and NDK so far? I'm liking it. I always do it. <laughs> NDK is a very good convention. I mean, I'm lucky that I don't have many bad convention experiences, but this is really, 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 really top drawer. Right. Uh, so I'm having a good time. Alright. Okay, um, also, I uh, want to ask, I'm not sure if we asked you this last year, mm -hmm. or, but, um, how did you get started into voice acting? You know, was there some a buddy who was working for a company and was like, "Hey, you know, come down here, and give it a shot"? Or no, I mean, I know, I know some people had that experience. Mine was a little more twisty and turny. I uh, grew up in Southern California, about an mm -hmm. hour out of LA. Uh, started doing musicals in high school. Started doing musicals, doing plays. Uh, continued that into college. Really got the acting bug and thought, "I want to go to LA. I'm go to LA." Be an actor because it's just as easy yeah. as that right you know mm -hmm. just, yeah. i'll show up they'll <laughs> hand me a script they'll be like oh thank god you're here <laughs> Whew, finally we can cast this role um so i went out to la right after college and really didn't have any idea what i was doing first time living away from home trying to be an actor really not knowing up, up from down yeah um so spent a year and a half learning life lessons mm -hmm. which was basically life kind of kicking my ass and me learning from it, which is valuable, but still after a while I'm like, okay, okay, no lessons, ow, ow, ow. Um, but before I had left for LA, uh, I was talking to the lady for whom I took uh, acting and singing lessons, and she said, well, you've got sort of an interesting voice, maybe you'd want to do voiceover on the side. So I thought, yeah, when I'm not you know, busy with film and TV, I suppose I could do some voiceover. Um, so I took some classes mm -hmm. and made a demo and uh, just randomly happened to find an audition notice for uh, an anime project. They didn't even call it anime in the audition notice, yeah. they, they mm -hmm. called it animation project. I'm like, well, I just dropped like 1300 bucks on an animation demo, so... <laughs> um, submitted it and was lucky enough that, uh, well, lucky enough to get in on it, period, mm -hmm. but lucky enough also that the company that brought me in it was only their like second or third project, so they oh. didn't have a stable of talent yet. Mm -hmm. So they were still getting their sort of ducks in a row. I got in with them on the ground floor as they kept getting projects, they kept bringing me in. Um, eventually from doing that, I got to know the other actors, they introduced me to other companies and sort of had that lateral you know, spread. Um, but in the beginning it was just sending in that demo to the right, the right audition notice for people that didn't already have uh, a young, low voice dude. Mm -hmm. So, I kind of lucked out. <laughs> uh, I believe you also voiced Germany? Yes. Yes. Indeed. And also, I forget his name, in Black Butler, the curry maker, correct? Agni, yeah. Agni, yes. yes. Um, when you're doing voices that require an accent, mm -hmm. do you maybe like try and do your best impression of an accent and work on it? Or do you go and like listen to tapes or something? Like to help kind of get the accent down, maybe learn the language a little bit. Mm. Yeah, try to. Like... Well, with Germany, I mean, we all hear a bunch of German accents <laughs> in the media, yeah. as it is. So I already had something sort of. I mean, we're hit with accents all the time yeah. in the media, difference of actors as we sort of take them and go, oh, cool, yeah. <laughs> like put that in the back of our head for, mm -hmm. for, for later use. Um, for Germany, I just basically. That, that was an audition that I wasn't even going to do. I was like, oh, I'm not going to get it anyway. I'm not going to bother. Um, so me recording was sort of a last minute, spur of the moment thing. So I didn't really do any research. I just rolled with the German accent that I already had sort of, you know, rattling around in my head. Um, and then when I got the part, they're like, okay, you got the part. So we played back the audition and basically went from there. Same thing with, with Agni and Black Butler. They were, by the time I was in on the audition process, 
they were specifically looking for the two Indian characters, and I thought, well, I don't really have an Indian accent, it's not something I get called on to do, but what the heck, I'll give it yeah. a shot. And, you know, when they liked him, I got the part, I thought, oh, okay, that's, <laughs> that's what I'll do. So I didn't, it, nothing that I, I feel with accents, unless it's something that you really don't hear very often, it's something that's technically difficult, at least for me, better just to roll with it, and if they like it, they like it, if they don't, they don't, because if you do too much prep work, at least mm -hmm. speaking for myself, I can almost get in my head too much and sort of stifle the performance because all I'm thinking about is the accent. I stop focusing on the, the acting, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, which might just be a long-winded way of saying that I'm an actor and I'm lazy, yeah. <laughs> but it worked out in those two cases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you do have a really deep voice Yeah. and I'm sure you get called on for a lot of stuff to where you, you probably have to move your voice deeper, make it more growlier. I believe you are the leader of the horde. Yes. You voice the leader of the horde, and yes. it sounds very scratchy, very itchy. I mean, it's right here, this <laughs> sort of thing. So it's... <laughs> yeah. Do you, like, do anything to help protect your voice, protect your throat from all that? Like, like something like maybe drink a little bit of honey to kind of... I mean, I do, the, I do the tea and the honey, the mm -hmm. throat lozenges. I've got some, uh, some Chinese cough syrup mm -hmm. that's pretty amazing. I mean, it, it, when you're doing stuff like that or you're working on a war game where you're getting shot 18 different ways and yelling grenade for a couple hours, you're gonna... You're gonna tire out your throat. There's no real way to get around the fact that you're gonna tear yourself up a bit. It's just yeah. a matter of when if, it happens. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you know what you're doing and you take care of your voice, you'll have a, a bigger window of opportunity before you start losing the voice. And yeah, it, it, that's what I tell people when I'll do something really vocally stressful, like, "Oh, I'm so sorry. Is that is that okay?" And I'm like, "You know, can you can you sustain that voice?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah I can. I can do this voice. I, I might not be able to do something afterwards." But for this, I'm okay. Like if I were recording, you know, that sort of thing, I could do that forever long I have to, as long as they don't come to me afterwards and be like, oh, uh, and do this 20-year-old character too. I'd be like, gone. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's basically just knowing how long you can sustain it and, and doing what you can to run out the clock. So. Okay. Um, you've also adapted and directed English devs, of course, Girl, uh, Girls Bravo, mm -hmm. Kemi Chu and Tales of Fantasia, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yes. Um, what's it like going from being an actor, vo voice actor, to, you know, sitting behind the scenes, mm -hmm. you know, and kind of going, well, let's try this out, or, you know, telling your fellow voice actors, you know, here, I want you to try this. It's not, it's not so, so different. I mean, it, it, it a lot, there's a reason the companies use, a lot of the companies use mm -hmm voice actors to be directors for this kind of stuff because you've been in the booth, mm -hmm. you understand having to hit the timing and do the acting and do the accent if there's an accent and do the do the physical exertion for the fight scenes. Um, there are people that direct that don't act mm -hmm. and they're good, I just don't know how they do it, yeah. having not <laughs> been in there themselves. Um, it's basically the same thing, it, the, the difference is you're now having to watch everybody's performance and make sure the pieces work together. I mean, that's, that's the big one, just making sure that as you're recording you know, this side of the conversation, and then two weeks later you record this side of the conversation, that when the dust clears and you have all the elements together, it actually sounds like a conversation, not just like, I am talking, I too am talking, I am talking to you, I am talking to you, where they're not really connecting. I mean, the director just has to keep in mind as that first person is laying down their dialogue, okay, this is how I think the other side of it's gonna sound, to make sure you get the right you know, chunk of this and then a chunk of this later put them together. So it's not too different. I mean, it's, it's mostly just the worry of, it's all on me. And sometimes it's a matter of, is this, you, how to say it, you get to know the actors that you work with and figure out what's most effective for everybody. Some people you just, they come in and you just get out of their way and let them do their thing. Other people, they'll want to give you another take each time, like they'll do it great. Can I give you another take? Can I give you another take? I want one more take. Can I give you another take? No, no, that was great. That was good. That was good. Some people don't mind if you give them a line read. If there's a really specific, because you are putting the conversation together two different times. If there's a really specific read you need, and you have to tell the actor, okay, you have to put the emphasis on this word. Some actors are like, yeah, fine. I, I'm not psychic. I can't read your mind. Tell me. Other actors are like, do not give me a line read. I am an actor. Do not tell me. I will figure it out myself. Um, 
So really it's just getting to know your peers as a director and figuring out what's going to be the most effective way of wrangling that performance out of them. Which is kind of a challenge because no two days are the same. Because you're like, oh, it's so and so, so I should be like this, or I should be like that, or I can tell jokes, or this is a person that doesn't want to tell jokes because they just want to be focused and do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's fun. It's, it's, it's interesting. Okay. Um, when you're working with the other actors, like it, when you're directing, like, As for Girl Bravo, you know, were there ever moments where you were kind of thinking evil thoughts, like, I could probably have some fun with these guys, just for a couple laughs? It, <laughs> I mean, you goof on people a little bit. It really depends on the time. If, if yeah. you're doing well and they're, they're in a jokey mood and you're in a jokey mood or you know them really well, you know, they'll do a line, you get on the talk back and be like, wow, that was really horrible. Move on. <laughs> or, you know, you flub a line terribly, you jump on the talk back, okay, that's the one we're going to use. Move it on. But not really, I, I, you don't mess with them too yeah. much. And again, it depends on the person. There's some people I could joke with all day long, other people where I'm like, no, I'm, I'm just going to keep it professional because they might not like that so much. Um, sometimes an actor will record a little joke for the other person in the scene. So when they come in to record, you know, actor A's line plays and then they say something silly and then the actor B just loses it when they're supposed to record their line because they weren't expecting whatever it is that they said. Um, so you do have those moments because okay. they're long days and you're in a box mm. talking about fake things. You get a little loopy, but uh, nothing, nothing too bad. You don't, you don't prank each other too bad. Um, as I don't know if anybody else does, but last year, before closing ceremonies, you all were gathered in an elevator. Yes. And well, you were going down, we were in the elevator next to you. And we were going down, we actually passed right by you. Um, you know, that was a funny story. Everyone was talking about for months how you know, all the voice actors, Janine, the director, uh, one of the directors here was with you guys. You know, got any more funny stories from past cons, this con, you know, that. Let's <laughs> That's a good one. Um, that one really sticks out. That was my one and only elevator <laughs> trap moment. Um, I don't know. They all melt together. You get such, you get such crazy weekends. Um, there was one time that something came up with my schedule to where I was at a convention for like 24 hours. Like I got there, was there, did all my stuff. And 24 hours later, I was literally getting back on the plane. I was like, where am I? It's David. Hey, glad to meet you. Say yourself. Okay, gotta go. Bye. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of other zany specific stories, but they've all melted into that general, yeah. like, con experience. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have a good one in my back pocket. I should, but I don't. I'll think of something. I don't have okay. one. <laughs> all right, well... As you know, the anime community is getting bigger and bigger with each passing year. Do you ever just stop and look and go like, wow, what have I helped create? <laughs> you know, does, do you ever feel overwhelmed by you know, being the person who, you know, you played all these parts, you did the voices for these, you brought you know, life into these characters, and these people you know, look up to them, they respect them, they respect you for your hard work and all you do. And do you ever just stop and go, wow? <laughs> It blows my mind. Like, sometimes I just stop and like, wait, people are standing in a line so that I will write on something they own with a Sharpie? That's weird. That's, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful, I mean, I'm so thankful that this thing that I'm working on, that is still, in the grand scheme of things, a very, yeah. very niche, yeah. niche subset of, of the entertainment industry has this sort of, of, of following and enthusiasm. It's cool because like I said, we record stuff, we're standing in a box, we're not even working with the other actor, and then it goes away and someday it's on a DVD on a shelf. So get, getting to come to events like, like Nandiscon and seeing thousands of people that are like, anime, booyah, it's a, it's a real shot in the arm because day to day life we don't get that from people. We're like, you know, like anime, manga, what's that? I don't know. So coming to something like this <clears throat> and getting that, you know, again, admittedly niche perspective, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice change of pace. I mean, I, I, I really respect the people that first started doing the dubs. I mean, I've got these. We do stuff on Pro Tools now. I've worked with people that are like, yeah, back in the day we recorded stuff on tape. I'm like, what? Oh, on tape? Like, yeah, tape. We literally have to cut things out, and it has to be perfect because we were on Pro Tools. We couldn't just like 
take something out digitally and move this and shake that. And how did anything ever get done? You know, I mean, everything's on VHS and people need a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Now, you know, you can go online and see the subs for something sometimes right when it's coming out in Japan. You get the simulcast. I mean, that's, that's insane. It is, it is the best time ever to be an anime fan. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, an now on the subject of anime, what did you think about doing Dead Man Wonderland? <laughs> Dead Man Wonderland was fun. <laughs> um, I was one of the writers on that, and I had a really good time with that, and then uh, got to audition for it. I don't always, since I live in Southern California, um, whether or not I get to audition for something with Funimation is completely at the discretion of the director, whether they want to send me the, the audition copy and even deal with having to schedule out of town, which is a big pain in the ass. Um, so when the copy came down the pike, I don't remember who else I read for. I think I read for a couple people, but Senji was definitely one of them. And then when I got Senji, I was like, oh, he's so cool. Um, and I had the added bonus that just, just luck of the draw with how the writing assignments had fallen <laughs> out, uh, most of the Senji episodes I had adapted. So when I got, they got to play this really fun character and read dialogue that I myself had written, and so we just, we just blasted through it because I hadn't seen all the lines before. Um, and it was on TV too, which I got to tell people like, hey, blah, 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 Toonami, it's there, watch it. Like, and hopefully people will buy the DVDs because there's another yeah. episode with Senji and it's very Senji-centric, shall I say. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was a blast. Um, speaking of Sanji, you know, when you're voicing him and they show you him, you know, they show, you know, give you a character model, perhaps of what he looks like, you know, what was your first impression of just, like, getting your first-hand look at him? You know, and trying to figure out what kind of voice do I have to give, you know, do I have to go high, do I have to go low? I mean, looking at him, he, and looking at the copy and already knowing what I had seen about him, he's, he's really not worried about stuff. He takes it all in stride, and then there's Gantu, who's like, oh my god, I'm in prison, what do I do? I have to eat candy, there's a collar, ah! So he's really, I mean, a lot of times just being like, hey, look, dumbass, this is how things are, you better wrap your head around it, you're gonna die. So that already affected, or informed, you know, where I was gonna put it read-wise. And the rest of it was just me guessing. I mean, the voices we do are usually some sort of combination or variation of what we've done before, so we sort of think, I think he's gonna be in this range, and then we do it, and especially when I'm recording auditions remotely, I just lay it down and send it in. You know, it's not like when you're there in person, you can do it once and then they give you feedback and you do it again. Um, the British just took a shot in the dark with it and thankfully they liked it, so. All right, well, Patrick Slice, we just want to thank you again for letting us interview you for a second time uh, here at Nandes, uh, Nandes Sukan. No, we hope you have a great uh, trip here. We hope you have a safe journey to your home or wherever future cons you go to. And I believe that's all we have for you. Thank you. Sweet. <laughs>